Hi, I'm Claudia Avila Cosnahan, Director of Mission and Partnerships at Common Wheel Magazine. Uh, welcome to Common Wheels The Wheel, uh, the Wheel Synod Conversation Series. Common Wheels The Wheel is a community of young people and those who desire to be in dialogue with them who seek to engage in conversations inspired by the, Catholics in the Catholic intellectual tradition. The Catholic Church's Synod on Synodality has the potential to be the most transformative moment since Vatican II. For the next five weeks, we will host conversations where we put in dialogue two of the Synod on Synodality's 10 themes through the lens and experience and expertise of leaders throughout the nation towards a more just, inclusive vision for the church. We'd like to thank the Chicago Theological Union St. Bernardine Center's local wheel community for being our host for the next five weeks. These videos will be available online after our live events. Today's two themes are listening and speaking out. Joining us are Victor Carmona, Assistant Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego. His areas of expertise include theological ethics, Catholic Latinx theolo theologies, Catholic social teaching, immigration ethics, theologies of migration and the Catholic church and migration. He is president elect of the Academy of Catholic Theologians of the United States. Also joining us are Alessandra Harris and Nate Tenner Williams, who are the co-founders of Black Catholic Messenger, an online media outlet. Alessandra Harris is an author, wife, mother of four. She earned degrees in comparative religious studies and Middle East studies, and is currently studying in the Diocese of San Jose Institute for Leadership and Ministry. Nate Tenner Williams is a Catholic seminarian, journalist and theology student living in Washington, DC. He's the editor of Black Catholic Messenger, studies at the Catholic University of America with the Josephites, and spends three weeks every summer in the Institute of Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University of Louisiana. We've asked our conversation partners to share about one of the Synod's themes. We'll begin with Victor Carmona, who we've invited to share about listening. Well, thank you for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here with, with everyone and joining in from the University of San Diego. So I'm gonna talk about just three points. First, my first point is why, why listening is an essential dimension of synodality. My second point, why listening, listening in the context of synodality, at least this is what I think, is at heart a spiritual exercise. And then my third point is why, at least in my experience, Listening and so in synodality is hard, it's very hard, but, but important. Now, I don't intend these three points to be exclusive of other points, and, and nor do I intend them to be exhaustive of what the synod is or, or might become or what it means or might mean. So on to my first, my first point. Listening is an essential dimension of synodality. Now, in Lumen Gentium chapter two, we get introduced to this idea of, of the church as the people of God, to you know, an idea that moves us away beautifully from a clericalist understanding of church. And from that perspective, the notion that as a people of God, we are, apologies, one second here, I'm gonna turn off my cell phone. Um, so from the perspective of chapter two, Lumen Gentium, the idea is that as a people of God, we are priests, a priestly people, a prophetic people, and a kingly or royal people. And it's these, these offices, uh, this sharing in, in Christ's uh, priesthood. Sorry, let me turn on my, my cell phone here. It keeps ringing, ringing. My apologies, everyone. So go <laughs> In chapter two of, of Lumen Gentium, we see this beautiful idea of it's the entire people of God who are called to proclaim the good news of God's love for the entire people, for, for the, all of humanity. And in sharing in that, uh, you know, in sharing in Christ's prophetic and priestly and royal office, uh, we have the ability of serving all of humanity and in fact of being a sacrament, a sign and symbol of God's love for, for all. Now, there are three concerns in the Vatevecum, um, and here I'm, I'm going off of paragraph eight. There are three concerns that the call for the synod on synodality has with regards to the church's ability to do this in the here and now. 
The first concern is a secularized mentality. The second concern is religious fundamentalism. And then the third concern is the effects of racial, ethnic, and caste division in our lives, both inside the church and outside. Now, it's important to highlight this reality, this third one, again, the effects of racial, ethnic, and caste divisions, because they hinder our ability not only to enjoy uh, the effects of, of, of God's love within the church, but also they limit our ability, they hinder our ability to proclaim the good news, good news of God's love uh, to the entire, the entire world. So that was my first point. On to my second point. Why listening in the context of synodality is at heart, at least this is what I think, a spiritual exercise. So listening in a spiritual key means... I think listening to discern where God is and where God is calling us to be. Now, here I want to uh, echo a beautiful insight that a colleague of, of, of mine from Venezuela highlighted. Uh, his name is Rafael Luciani. And in one of his works, Rafael points us to this, this conversation that Francis had with, with, um, with clergy, religious, and seminarians in Bolivia. And there, he said the following in his, in his reading of, of the Gospel of, of Mark. Um, he, he told this gathering, one of the great temptations that we encounter on the path as we follow Jesus is to separate these two things, listening to God and listening to our brothers and sisters, both of which belong together. We need, Francis goes on, to be aware of this, the way we listen to God the Father is how we should listen to God's faithful people. If we do not listen in the same way, with the same heart, then something has gone wrong. To pass by, Francis goes on, without hearing the pain of our people, without sinking roots in their lives and in their world. This is like listening to the word of God without letting it take root and bear fruit in our hearts. Like a tree, a life without roots is one which withers and dies. Now, I love these words of Francis because they echo Gustavo Gutierrez's insight on spirituality. For Gutierrez, spirituality is at the root of Christian life. It is where the love of God and the love of neighbor are daily tied together. So, Synodality is this exercise of being able and willing to listen to one another as we're sharing where we feel God is calling us in our lives, both individually and jointly. Um, it's, it's an exercise that assures us not just of the presence of God, you know, on Sunday during Mass and so on, but more importantly, from the perspective of, of, of these documents, of the presence of God and the people of God itself. And listening to God's voice in that people of God from the perspective of the synod is as beautiful and important a need for, for the church today, right now. So with that reality in mind, the challenge for us is that parishes and movements in the church do in fact reflect the racial, ethnic, and caste divisions of our society. And here I'm keeping this notion of caste in the Vatican because of Isabel Wilkerson's insight that race is our own caste system here in the United States. So that was the second point. Then now I move to the third and final point that I wanted to make. So why listening in a key of synodality, at least in my experience, is hard yet very important. When I graduated from college, I decided that I, was, I wanted to serve in the church in some way, shape or form to just walk with immigrants and refugees and to do the best that I could to support the church's ability to do so, especially in Mexico. Um, I was in my early 20s at the time. And what I remember was I had this desire to help the Catholic, the Catholic church in Mexico, particularly through the Mexican Conference of Catholic Bishops. I felt this desire to help the church there, and again, especially it's his bishops, get up a clear sense of what was happening on the ground with regards to the church's response to the needs of immigrants and refugees. So I worked with them for two years in a process and a project that basically involved 
visiting all the ports of entry across the US Mexico and the Guatemala Mexico border. And I would literally just with my backpack go and I would ask around, hey, is there a migrant shelter around here? Um, and what I found, and here thanks to the support of Catholic Relief Services, what I found was that there were over 40 shelters, migrant shelters across Mexico. Before we had begun this project, we thought that there were just three. Now, that in itself was you know, an exciting find, but it was also a very humbling experience because um, what I learned was that a lot of our, of our siblings in faith who were serving in these shelters um, had been feeling forgotten by the church. Um, they felt like nobody listened to them. They felt like the bishops had, had ignored their work for the previous, in many cases, decades. So for me, as someone who was working with and, and on behalf of, of the bishops of Mexico at that point, what was difficult was that in a way it felt like a ministry, this is what I called it at the time, a lightning rod ministry. I felt like a lightning rod. Um, as a young layman, um, it was very humbling to just sit, shut up and listen. Um, there was a lot of hurt. And what was difficult was acknowledging that I wasn't directly responsible for that hurt. And yet at the same time, um, I had to listen and I had to do my best to bring that hurt to the bishops and, and set, set things aright as, as, best, as best we could. Um, so sometimes, Doing this listening in the context of synodality, I think, calls us to be mindful that many of the failures of the church that we're seeing, maybe they're not, we're not responsible for them directly. But aside from that, and aside from the possibility that in some cases we might be, um, it's the responsibility of us all to, to listen. And in that listening, hopefully be converted. Um, and hopefully that's an ongoing conversion process that helps us better discern where God present in God's own people is calling us to be so that we may better proclaim the good news of God's love for all. And that's it. That's, those were the three points that I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, I, uh, I feel like you've, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, so I want to invite all of our viewers uh, to kind of sit with, with your reflection um, while we listen to, to Alessandra and Nate share um, their thoughts. Um, and after their sharing, we will, we will invite you three to, um, to put your two reflections in dialogue. Um, so at this moment, I invite Alessandra and Nate to share on the theme of speaking out. In Luke chapter four, when Jesus begins his public ministry, scripture says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, stands up and reads from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, declaring, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Acts, in Acts of the Apostles chapter two, after Jesus's resurrection and before his ascension, Jesus tells the apostles that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's exactly what happens during Pentecost. The apostles are filled with the Holy Spirit, and it propels them to go forth and speak out, proclaiming the truth about Jesus and the gospel message. When we received the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, we too were filled with the Holy Spirit. However, it is an encounter with God that gives people throughout the ages the courage to speak out in freedom, truth, and charity both within and outside the church. In the Hebrew scriptures, prophets, kings, and holy people are called by God. In our canon of saints, 
we have the witness of holy people who encountered Jesus, Jesus who filled them with courage for the mission God had for them. This has led to the founding of religious orders, the writing of theological doctrine, the building of institutions and missionary work throughout the world. As Catholics, we're all created and given a mission that will build God's kingdom on earth. We're all given spiritual gifts and natural talents that help us be supernaturally effective. As the Vatican's official handbook for listening and discernment in local churches on the Synod states, the faithful have received the Holy Spirit in baptism and confirmation and are endowed with diverse gifts and charisms for the renewal and building up of the church as members of the body of Christ. Knowing our gifts, let us most effectively speak out and proclaim the gospel message. So while all baptized Christians are given these spiritual gifts, it's only through a relationship with God that we say yes to the mission God has for us and our charisms and gifts are cultivated and manifested. Almost four years ago at a small prayer meeting, I had someone speak a prophetic word to me. He said that I had so much of God's grace, wisdom from life experiences and love on the inside, but I needed to share it with the world. That's true for all of us. And I want to speak that to everyone who is watching this live or will watch it later recorded. God has blessed you with gifts, talents, and experiences that God needs you to share for the church and the world. As the Vatican document explains about the meaning of the synod process, by reflecting together on the journey that has been made so far, the diverse members of the church will be able to learn from one another's experiences and perspectives guided by the Holy Spirit. My number one charism is writing. So one of the ways I feel most comfortable and effective speaking out is through writing. Nate will talk a little bit more about how we and a group of lay Black Catholics co-founded Black Catholic Messenger as a way for us to speak out about issues that affect the Black Catholic community, the larger Black community, and the whole church. We just celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, and I'm sure we all think of him when we think of speaking out on issues of racial justice and equality. But there are other ways God, people also use their God-given talents to speak out. Examples that come to mind are the Christian artist Kelly Lattimore, who has used his icons to speak out on justice issues, and the Black Catholic poet laureate Amanda Gorman, who has used her poetry to speak out and has inspired a new generation of young people to find their voice. When we're grounded in faith in God and filled with the Holy Spirit, we are exceptionally effective and fruitful when we use our charisms and talents to communicate with the world. When God is working through us, we're inspired to use our voices to speak out when the Spirit calls us to. Now I'll pass the mic to Nate. Thank you, Alessandra, for that for that wonderful overview. Um, I am Nate Tanner, as been as has been said earlier. I am in formation with the Society of Saint Joseph of the Sacred Heart, better known as the Josephites. Um, we are a community, a religious community that since 1893 has been dedicated to serving the African American community. Uh, there's no other society of priests like that in the United States, and I think it's important that. I'm coming from that perspective because by the very nature of our, our work, we have always had a mission focused on social justice here in America. And with that has come the focus on speaking out. And so since my conversion in 2019, my whole focus really in my work and also in my personal understanding of Catholicism has been about just that seeking justice in the context of the church in the United States, which is a story about speaking out. Um, dating back to the period of slavery, we have constantly been dealing with this struggle here in America. And I wanna read from this statement that was released in actually 1968 by the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus. And it reads that because of the past 
complicity with and active support of prevailing attitudes and institutions of America, the church is now in an extremely weak position in the black community. It goes on to say, unless the church by an immediate and effective and total reversing of its present practices rejects and denounces all forms of racism within its ranks, she will become unacceptable in the black community. We, the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus, strongly and deeply believe that there are few choices left to the Catholic Church. And unless it is to remain an enclave speaking to itself, it must consult the Black members of the church, clerical, religious, and lay. And that stuck out to me as part of a longer statement that is really reflecting the need for synodality, specifically in the context of uh, African-American Catholics and the larger discussion of justice in the American church. Um, when you look back through history, you see figures like Father Claude Pascal Mesh, who was a priest in New Orleans, who was one of the only priests in that era to speak out against the Confederacy and in support of the abolition of slavery. You have Father John Slattery, who actually founded the Josephites, the community I'm in formation with. He was one of the first to call for a native um, Black priesthood so that the church could grow in this community that has been living in apartheid. Um, you have, outside of that focus, you have the controversy that we all know of, the child sex abuse crisis, which was, of course, a story about speaking out, speaking the truth, no matter what the cost. And the theme of these people's lives was often that of the pushback they received. Um, when they spoke out, there was often retribution, both from the general public, from cat lay Catholics, and also from the hierarchy. Um, but these people lived that, that charism of justice, that charism of, of speaking out, which Pope Francis is calling us to now in the Synod. Um, in more recent history, we have the Black Lives Matter movement, which I'm sure many of you have, have marched in and supported. Um, and those who have spoken out in support of it in the church have often received, again, pushback. Um, we've had bishops just within the past few months who have restricted parishes who had put up a sign outside their church. Um, and also bishops who have spoken out saying that these movements are pseudo religions. Um, this is the kind of life that is lived by those who are willing to speak out in, in the church. This is what they, what they may face, but that is the story of, um, of supporting justice in the church. Uh, you also have the Berrigan brothers, which many of you know of, two of the most, I would say, the most important priests in US Catholic history, Daniel and Philip. Daniel was a Jesuit. Philip was a Josephite, actually. And many people do not know that. And so I feel we as Catholics have to embrace that legacy, often that hidden legacy of our church in order to um, really fulfill this thing that Pope Francis is calling us to here in the Synod, that of speaking out. Um, and specifically concerning the work that Alessandra and I have involved ourselves in, our publication as noted is called Black Catholic Messenger. And we kind of chose to be on the nose with the name, but we're not the first uh, newspaper of, of this type. The original Black Catholic newspaper, national newspaper in America was actually called the American Catholic Tribune founded by Daniel Rudd in the late 1800s. And he was also a black Catholic who was willing to speak out. He saw the needs of the church, which are even more amplified at that time, as you can imagine. And he decided that his call in his life was to speak out. Um, he ended up training multiple other black Catholic journalists to do the same kinds of work, whether they were working with him or in their own contexts. Among them uh, are Delilah Beasley, who did her work in Northern California, while Rudd did his work from uh, the East Coast, starting in Ohio and later in uh, Pennsylvania. You also have um, figures within the National Black Catholic Clergy Caucus, as mentioned, and you also have the National Black Sisters Conference, which was formed as a, as a group immediately after the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus because they refused to allow women uh, into their group. And I believe that uh, the voice of women was also going to be essential to this synod because of the position of women in the church as it was then in 1968 when the sisters realized they were not welcome in a meeting of their brothers uh, who were leaders in the catholic church um, and those sisters have continued their work 
uh, many of you have seen uh, recently, they put out a statement uh, responding to that of the USCCB president, which had spoken against social justice. They put out this statement saying that was wrong. They called him to dialogue. They called him to correction. Um, they lived this, this life of speaking out, which they have now been a part of for uh, 70 years, almost 70 years. Um, and just yesterday or over the weekend, they put out a statement in support of voting rights. And these are the kinds of voices that are not often talked about in the church. Uh, right now, people are begging the bishops to speak out on voting rights issues, but here we have uh, the groups that actually are speaking out. And this was actually their second statement on that topic. Um, you also, I'm sure many of you have heard of Gloria Purvis and, and what she went through in the year 2020. And since then, concerning her speaking out on the issue of racism in the church, uh, she was basically fired from her job because of her willingness to speak out in support of Black Lives Matter and other issues of racism. So I think all of these things together, you see that this there's this common thread of, of this charism of social justice connected to the to the mission of speaking out, which um, we all must be a part of in this um, journey on synodality. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Nate, Nate and uh, Alessandra. So as you've heard each other's experiences and your um, and your thoughts uh, around these two themes, uh, listening and speaking out. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about each other sharing? What a role and dynamics of the two themes um, do you see playing out within church and society? So I invite uh, Victor to kind of join the table again. And um, this is a time where you three can respond to one another sharing um, and kind of help us find some connective threads. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you both. I mean, it's, you know, I, I'm in listening to you um, and afterwards, I kept thinking of, of the reality of, of how, yeah, how we fail to, you know, to, to listen when others are speaking up, um, especially around difficult, difficult realities like race and racism. Um, in America, uh, one of the questions that I often get in, in when I, I'm out in public is, well, what do we do with people who, who don't want to listen, who push back, you know, just, just echoing Nathaniel what you were saying, you know, who push back without even just giving, giving a fair hearing. And, and honestly, I don't, I don't have the answer. I, I've, I've, so I'd, I'd be really curious to see what both of you think, especially in light of the experience of, of Black Catholics in America. Um, so, you know, this is, this is my, my initial reaction and, and thank you both for bringing this to the, to the table, this, these experiences. One thing that I wanted to say um, about your, your um, talk, Victor, was that I think it's so important for people to listen without feeling like they have to do something. I think that a lot of times when people talk about issues like racism or you know inequality, they feel like they're personally being attacked. And there's it's like, well, I didn't do that. I'm not racist. I would never do that. And it's like, no one's accusing you of doing that. We're just asking you to listen to our experience. And I think that with that a lot of times Black Catholics feel like the USCCB are not listening to the experience of Black Catholics, but we do feel that Pope Francis is listening. And he has, you know, he has talked about the racial justice movement and he has called the people who were engaged um, social poets and the collective Good Samaritan. So I feel like with the synod process, even though we might not feel like the U.S. church is always listening, we feel like we have an opportunity to be heard in the larger global universal church. And I would echo that by saying there's a long tradition of that, that dynamic where uh, often we hear, we have a listening ear in Rome that we don't necessarily have stateside, which I mean, 
it's no mystery why, because, you know, if the people perpetrating the violence against you are the ones that you're living with, yeah, they're not going to be the ones to listen to you. Um, so, yeah, often you've seen the Pope or other officials at the Vatican, you know, either make statements or take actions that um, that the, the local hierarchy, hierarchy just wouldn't. For example, you have us, Venerable Augustus Tolton, who's a the first known Af openly African-American priest who's now on his way to sainthood. And the only reason he was ordained in the first place was because um, uh, the seminary in Rome was willing to accept him, which was something no seminary in America would do. So on that note, I would think when you ask the question, what do we do? I, I have to say, look back, look back into the history books, do the research to see um, who, who your allies are and what strategies you might be able to employ to move forward and to help others around you move forward if you yourself are not, you know, the one on the receiving end, um, that you can, you can uh, speak with knowledge and have and be able to make a strategy. And I think that the Senate itself is the Pope um, giving that opportunity to the laity in a way that has not been given before is, you know, Here's a strategy for change that you did not previously have access to. You know, Victor, you said something earlier. Um, you said that it's important that we can, that we learn how to sit down, shut up and listen because there's a lot of pain. And what struck me was that um, what both of you are sharing or I say both of you are talking about black Catholic messengers as one, but what you three are sharing is this idea that there is kind of a, a fine line that we walk when we're when we're thinking about listening and speaking out that there seems to be a need for discernment to knowing when to do which of the two and that sometimes when we if we choose to speak out when it's time to listen we might be causing more pain and so that's that's what kind of came to my mind when you said shut up and listen because there is a lot of pain. Um, could you three speak, a, or one of you, if you feel uh, inspired to do so, expand a little bit on that fine line that we walk and how to know when to do which one? I can um, speak to that a little bit. I think that that's one reason why Pope Francis focuses so much on being inspired by the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit. And that's why um, I, in my talk, I really wanted to mention how uh, your relationship with God needs to really be the foundation before you speak out. Because it's like, um, when you're speaking out, you want to speak out in truth and in charity. You don't want to lash out at people. So I feel like when you are connected and you have a relationship with God and you feel like you're in a position where you're able to discern the Holy Spirit and where he's leading you, that you feel that you're able to speak out in a way that's charitable with love, even if it is firm and even if it is calling out the, you know, the inequality or the, um, the unjust situations that you, you see. And for, and for me, this is, this is where, where the insight of listening, being also a spiritual act is, is, or a spiritual exercise is very, is helpful. Um, because, I mean, it, it's very interesting to me because at least for me, when I started studying, studying, studying theology and, and uh, you know, even before, uh, sorry, after I had, had gone through this experience with the migrant shelters, I wholeheartedly identified with the prophetic office of the church. Like I just, just speak up when you see injustices around you, you know, try to do what's right and so on. Um, but when I started, um, you know, just just conversing with people and and you know with immigrants themselves and with with those who who minister with them in, in migrant shelters, um, I was just humbled by the sheer weight of reality. And what was challenging for me in terms of this response, this, this speaking up, 
was that on the one hand, at times I felt like reality was weighing me down, like just the sheer size of the injustices that I was witnessing um, in some parts of Mexico for the first time in my life. Um, I felt like just, I didn't know what to do. And, and I would just freeze. Um, and yet over time, what I realized um, in conversations with migrants and you know, those who minister with them in shelters and with the bishops who, who I worked with, um, you know, that listening I learned really grounded our ability to speak up um, and to defend the ability, for example, of shelters to serve migrants and refugees in Mexico. Because at that time there was a debate going on in Mexico as to whether that was actually legal and whether those serving in shelters were breaking the law. Um, so, so there was an immediate consequence for this kind of ministry uh, that was taking place. Um, but I, I wish that at the time I had conceived of, of listening and, and the, you know, speaking up as a spiritual, having a spiritual component, um, because you know, I find that, that to be very helpful most of the time. I don't know. So that's, Nathaniel, I'm curious, what's, what's your take on this? You know, it's, it's a fraught topic, I think, because from my perspective, there's so little, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the hierarchy and it seems like often they never speak out in support of our issues. So, for, so that makes me want to say, you know, it's always time for them to speak. It's always time for them to speak out in support of us, which is something that's so rare. But about when it's the time to to listen, I'm frustrated because I think, you know, it's been centuries, centuries of, of listening. It's not a question of ignorance. It's a question of, of understanding and of fortitude. Are you willing to speak? And so, yeah, but on the other hand, I know that there are times when, you know, in more local settings, you wonder, are these, are people trying to draw attention to themselves by speaking out or are they actually concerned about the issue? Um, and so it, you can see activists, um, let's say more underground activists who are frustrated by those who speak out and are making millions off of their, of, of their activism and their su ostensible support for a cause. So you might wanna say, well, this person actually should not be the one with the microphone. So, you know, you have to find a balance there, but I think, how do you know when it's time to speak out if you haven't spoken out yet? That's a good sign that, you know, it's your turn. Uh, but again, there are, there's caveats to that, but I, I do wish that you could see the more, the most visible people speaking out in support of these, these marginalized groups, which you, you, Victor and Alessandra and I have both um, covered two different groups, but you know, the same struggle. I think you've, uh, you've already begun to kind of maybe begun to allude a little bit to my next and final question, but um, I, I wanna invite you three to, to now discuss in more broader terms, the question, the foundational question posed by the Synod on Synodality, which is kind of a two-parter. The first part is how is synodality a requirement of the gospel of the mission? I, I think you've already begun to really unpack that. But secondly, as you contemplated the role of listening and speaking out as, as um, kind of like theological themes or categorical themes in the church, what steps do we take now? Like what is necessary of the church for it to grow in these areas? And so that it can truly be an authentically synodal church. I think if you look at the very earliest years of the church, you see um, you see a framework for what for what's happening now with the synod. I was always fascinated when I was when I was in college studying theology at the fact that in the Bible you have a synod. You have the as, the, as it's called the Council of Jerusalem, where there was major controversy in the church along actually ethnic lines, cultural lines, and it got to the point where the church, the leaders of the church, we can call them bishops, said, 
there's no way we're going to solve this unless we get together, talk it out, find a solution and address it um, and implement it rather. So from the very earliest times of the church, you see this, this need for synodality, synodality. So when you ask, how is it called the gospel? I think we see that in order for the church to even become what it is now, for better or for worse, they had to get together and, and listen and, and, and chat, <laughs> you know, talk back and forth, see what's working, what's not working, and to look inwardly and also at, you know, of course, the word of God to, to understand. And, uh, and for that council, the Council of Jerusalem, a lot of what they were talking about was, you know, what, does, what has God already said to us? And based on that, how do we move forward? So I think if we can, you know, recreate that principle now, as the bishops have done in ecumenical councils now for thousands of years, um, you know, they're inviting us now. Be a part of this, lady. It's, it's, it's your turn to, to, to have a voice in this, not just the academics, not just the high powered lay people, but, you know, people on the ground, people who have, have looked at the church and said, I don't know if I, if I want this. People walked away. And they're inviting everybody to participate now in this, in, in, in this recreation of what we saw in the ancient church. And to me, that's exciting. And it shows that this is what the church has always been. Do you want to go first, Alessandra? Um, sure. So I was just going to say that um, I think that the aspect of journeying together and really listening to people and including the people who are on the peripheries and the marginalized and even people who are um, Catholic but have, are no longer practicing. I think um, joining together and having all of these people talk about the future of the church and talk about the mission of the church and talk about um, the way forward being led by the spirit. Um, I feel like that's um, that that's exactly what our church needs right now. And there's so many divisions that I just see within the United States. And I feel like bringing those voices together um, for a common purpose um, to talk about the church is going to be what's going to really help us um, bridge that gap and overcome those divisions. I mean, and for me, it's, it's, um, I mean, I'm, 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 it's been interesting for me as, to see how the conversation around synodality has really taken root in the Spanish speaking world. Um, I see a lot of activity and action throughout uh, Latin America and Spain. And, and frankly, it's exciting and energizing and there's questions and, and so on and so forth, you know. But here in the states, it's it's kind of it's it's been it's been sad, you know, to see that there isn't a, a similar reaction, at least as far as I can tell. Um, I'm fortunate enough to live in a in a church in a diocese where you know the conversation around synodality does really seem to be taking root. You know, we're we're just uh, starting it here. Um, it's going to be a three year long process here in San Diego, uh, uh, organized around the Sea Judge Act method you know one year to see or listen one year to discern and one year to to act based on on what comes out um but i think that in terms of what we can do um yeah echoing what what alessandra and, and nathaniel said um we need to engage <laughs> echoing the listening we need to engage in in listening from one another and and not just not just uh, with the clerics in mind, including the clerics, of course, but in religious, but the laity. Like I, 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 I think that as laity, we need to to just feel more at ease with the fact that it's our church. I mean, it, of course, yes, the the bishops are you know, are ministers and you're know, part of the people of God, but they are not the entirety of the people of God. All of us are the people of God. And I think it's, you know, Francis's call to this synod on synodality, this call to being a church of synodality is, is a beautiful challenge and invitation, especially to the laity, to 
take our church. It's our church to listen to one another and to discern where God is calling us in our lo cotidiano, in our daily lives, um, even around difficult conversations, but important ones uh, around realities like, like racism here in America, inside and outside our church. Thank you so much for your reflections and your expertise and your experience. It's been such a pleasure to be in conversation with with uh, Alessandra Harris, with Nathaniel Tenor Williams, and with Victor Carmona. Um, thank you for spending this time with us. Um, I, I know that we're not in a shared space where we can all applaud and be excited, but I know that that's the energy in our virtual room. So now it's time for all of us to join the conversation. I invite our common wheel, wheel community to reflect on the following two questions. What are the requirements or the criteria the characteristics of listening and speaking out in the church and society. And as you contemplate the po uh, the, what you've heard today uh, from, our, from our three panelists, what do you think are the um, necessary steps needed to grow as a synodal church in your particular experience? What are the obstacles that you see, the opportunities that you see? So we'll take a moment in silence to prepare our thoughts. 